Thank you, sir. Um, right. Well, I better uh, get the whole day off then, if I'm, if it's all meant to be one one long topic. Um, well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to kick it off with a story, um, actually more more like a creation myth. Um, you may have heard that uh, the internet was designed to withstand nuclear attack. Uh, it's not exactly true. What is true is that uh, Paul Buran, who's working at the Rand Corporation, he was investigating ways of, of making resilient networks, networks that were resilient to failure. Um, and part of that is to do with the design of the network itself, but he also hit upon this idea of packet switching, the idea that you take your, your message and you, you divide it up into small chunks, and then you route those small chunks around the network using whatever the most efficient route is. It's the same idea was simultaneously discovered by Donald Davies in the UK, but it, it's Paul Buran's idea that caught the eye of Leonard Kleinrock, who was working uh, for the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, on something called the ARPANET. And to begin with, the ARPANET, which is uh, the idea of time-sharing computers over a network, <coughs> was very small. This is it in 1969. Uh, and the very first message was sent from one machine to another on October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 p.m. And it was a very simple command sent from UCLA to Stanford, and it was simply the command to log in. So that command was sent, and the entire system crashed after two characters. <laughs> so this was the first message sent on the ARPANET. Uh, but they kept working on it, and the network grew and grew. It began to grow so much that other networks were being connected to this network, and it started to evolve into more like a network of networks, or an internetwork, if you will. And as networks joined this network of networks, it became more and more important that they were all speaking the same low-level language. And that's where these two come in, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf. Uh, and now, back then, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf were young and idealistic, and they were not so much concerned with making a, a network that was resilient to, say, nuclear attack, but they were extremely concerned with making a network that was resilient to any kind of top-down control, right? Any kind of, um, uh, of, of ownership, really. And the idea was that this network shouldn't have a center, um, that you didn't need to ask permission to add a node to the network. And they came up with the TCP uh, IP, the Transmission Control Protocol, and Internet Protocol. And the real secret sauce of TCP IP is its simplicity. It is it's very much a, a super simple protocol for a deliberately dumb network. And the whole idea of the Internet is that the network doesn't care what's in those packets being routed around uh, uh, the, the nodes of the network. Um, and TCP IP itself is designed to be super simple. In fact, they used to, they used to joke that you, know, you should be able to implement uh, TCP IP using two tin cans and a piece of string. <coughs> now, the idea was that once you had this very simple low-level protocol, and if you think about what a protocol is, protocol in, in diplomatic terms, right, it's an agreement. That's all it is. Let's all agree that we use this same low-level protocol. Then you can build on top of that, and you can add you know, more complex protocols on top. Protocols for sending and receiving email, right, telnet, the file transfer protocol, uh, gopher. And anyone could do this. In fact, you can still do this. If you want to create a protocol today, just go ahead and do it. You don't need to ask for permission, right? You just put your protocol out there. See, making the protocol isn't the hard part. It's convincing people to use your protocol. That turns out to be the tricky bit. Because you want to make use of Metcalf's law, right? Bob Metcalf, creator of Ethernet. And his, what's his law? It's like the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of nodes, something like that. Basically, what he's saying is the more people use a network, the more valuable the network is. Right? So the first person to have a fax machine had a useless lump of machinery. But as soon as one other person had a fax machine, it was exponentially more useful. Right? So making a protocol, not a problem. Convincing people to use your protocol, challenging. So this was the situation with the internet, where we have this low-line protocol. You can create more complex protocols on top. This was the situation at the end of the 80s, start of the 90s, when a new protocol appears on the scene, the Hypertext Transfer <laughs> Protocol, HTTP. And HTTP is just one part of a three-part stack called the World Wide Web Project. HTTP for the 
protocol layer, URLs for identifiers, and a super simple format called HTML uh, for, for the resources. Now, uh, this World Wide Web project, as you know, is the work of a young computer scientist named Tim Berners-Lee, uh, working at CERN. Well, what I love about this, this is, look how happy he is with his project, the World Wide Web project. At this point, it only exists on one computer, and yet he still called it the World Wide Web project. That is, that is confidence. And um, there's a whole bunch of influences went into the World Wide Web project. Uh, the internet itself, right? This idea that you shouldn't need to ask for permission, that there is no center to the network. But I also think that one of the influences on the World Wide Web was where Tim Berners-Lee was working, because this is where he was, right? CERN, um, um, an amazing place, right? Underneath the border between Switzerland and France, where you've got the most complicated piece of machinery, the Large Hadron Collider, ever created by, by humanity, recreating conditions from the start of the universe. You've got this ridiculous level of international cooperation required to even make the thing happen. And then you've got scientists who win Nobel Prizes, collaborating with students on summer internships, and there's practically no hierarchy there, just people working on experiments, and it somehow works. And it's producing enormous amounts of data, and people are trying to collaborate, and yet they're allowed to use whatever hardware they want, they're allowed to use whatever software they want, they're allowed to use whatever <laughs> formats they want. How do you make sense of this? So this was kind of the, the challenge facing Tim Berners-Lee and the other computer scientists at CERN, is given this crazy, chaotic, and yet somehow working situation at CERN, how do we enable the flow of information? And Tim Berners-Lee's uh, Berners idea was, was this uh, using hypertext, right? He didn't create hypertext. The idea of hypertext has been around for for many decades before, with you know, Ted Nelson and Van Ivar Bush and people like that. And, and Tim Berners-Lee himself had played around with a hypertext system a few years before. It was called Inquire. Uh, and it, was, it was based off this Victorian book of manners called Inquire Within Upon Everything, which I always thought would be a great name for the World Wide Web, right? Inquire Within Upon Everything. So there's all these influences uh, playing into this idea of the World Wide Web. And it comes together in this proposal that Tim Berners-Lee submits to his, his supervisor, Mike Sendall, which has a very uninspiring title, Information Management, a Proposal, right? Uh, but his, his supervisor must have seen something in this because uh, when this landed on his desk, he scrolled across the top, vague but exciting, right? And so we get the World Wide Web, which is excellent. But like I said, it's not enough to just create something you have to also convince people to use it. And what Tim Berners-Lee realized is that the way you, you get adoption is by making things, well, to use the apocryphal Einstein quote, as simple as possible but no simpler, right? So it isn't so much about making the best possible system or the best possible format or the best possible protocol. It's making something that people will use. And I think if you look at the pieces of the World Wide Web, there's something to that. None of these are the best at what they do, right? HTTP isn't the best protocol. Um, but it's simple enough that people can get started. In fact, all of these things have their flaws, definitely. But they're simultaneously simple enough and yet powerful enough to allow people to get started using them. HTML being a, a good example. Um, the first version of HTML, there was no official version 1.0 of HTML, right? All there was was this document called HTML Tags, presumably written by Tim Berners-Lee, which documented the entirety of HTML at the time, which was 21 elements. That was it. That was all of HTML. And of those 21 elements, almost all of them were taken wholesale from an existing markup language already being used at CERN. Right. The scientists at CERN were using a flavor of SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language, to mark up their documents. In fact, you could take some of those SGML documents, change the file extension to .html, and open it in one of these newfangled web browsers, and it would probably work. Uh, so it was very much about, instead of trying to change people's behavior, just nudge people's behavior slightly, right? And then you're bound to get better adoption. And it turned out to be true and people started writing documents in HTML, which wasn't even what Tim Berners-Lee expected. Tim Berners-Lee expected that the, the resources that people would be sharing would be in all sorts of different proprietary formats, but there would be HTML documents to kind of just link to them, kind of just as index pages. But it turned out to be simple enough and yet powerful enough that people started writing the actual documents in HTML itself, and HTML grew and grew to the extent that by the time we get to HTML5, there's 121 elements, and yet it's still HTML, 
Now, this kind of blows my mind, that you can have a format that, that grows you know, from 21 to 121 elements over the course of you know, 20 years or so, and yet still remains the same format. Because if you know anything about the history of you know, computer formats, you realize how unusual this is. If you try to open up a word processing document from 20 years ago, using a computer from today, you're going to have a bad time. Right? And yet HTML is still parsable. An, an HTML document from 20 years ago is still parsable in a modern browser. Even better, theoretically, if you're building it right, you could take a modern website and open it with a web browser from 20 years ago. And that is really unusual, right, in, in, in terms of computer formats, that, that this, this longevity uh, could, could happen for 20 years. And I think part of the reason why it's possible is down to a design decision with HTML. So at the risk of teaching grammar to suck eggs, I want you to think about what happens when a browser encounters an HTML element. Right? You've got a start tag, a closing tag, and some content in between. Maybe there'll be some attributes on that opening tag. But basically, when the browser sees this, it uh, renders the content in between the opening and closing tags. Now, depending on the element, it might also do some other things. It might style it a certain way. It might add behaviors if it's a link or a form element or something like that. But generally, this is what happens. All right, you all know this, right? Give a browser an element, it displays what's in between the opening and closing tags. But what happens when you give a browser an element it doesn't understand? Right? An element that doesn't exist in HTML. It's still got an opening tag, it's still got a closing tag, and it's still got content in between. Well, what the browser will do is it will display the content in between, same as it does with an element that it does understand. What's interesting here is what the browser does not do. And this is the design decision that I think was so crucial. The browser does not throw an error to the end user. The browser does not stop parsing the HTML document at this point and refuse to parse any further. It simply ignores the tags it doesn't understand, displays the content in between those tags, and carries on as though nothing had happened. And that is how we get to go from 21 to 121 elements. Because every time we add an element to HTML, we know exactly how older browsers, older user agents will behave. They'll ignore the tags they don't understand, but still display the content. So that's how we can start using new elements even before every browser has support for them. And this behavior is something we can even take advantage of for more complex elements. So you've got something like the canvas element, right? Very complex, requires scripting to do anything. If we know that an older browser will display what's ever between the opening and closing tags, well, let's say, OK, if you're a newer conforming browser and you do understand Canvas, don't show what's in between the opening and closing tags. And that means we can use that space for fallback content. So we can put information there specifically for older browsers. Right? So we can start using a new complex element and still have some kind of fallback for older browsers. Now that's not an accident. That's a deliberate design decision. Because the Canvas element, when it first started life, was a proprietary element created by Apple. This is how a lot of standards gets made. Uh, you know, one browser will just create something, other browsers go, ooh, that's good, we'll have that. And then they standardize on it, right? But when Canvas was, was invented by Apple, it was a standalone element that didn't have a closing tag. It was during the standardization process that it gained this closing tag, specifically so that we could do this, so that we could put this fallback content in between. And you see the same pattern with things like video and audio. Here's an interesting element, the image element. I, I find it interesting for its history, um, because at the start of the web, there was no image element. There, was, there were no images, right? It was a text-only medium. Uh, and in those early days, when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web Project, he also was running this mailing list, www.talk, which is pretty much everybody who was on the internet, or on the web, sorry. And everyone who was on the web was pretty much making a web browser. So it was basically people making web browsers, getting together and discussing how they were going to evolve this project, how they were going to evolve HTTP or evolve HTML. And they're having this discussion about the idea that there could perhaps be images on the World Wide Web. And they're de debating about what it should be called. Should it be called the icon element? Maybe it should be called the object element, because one day there might even be video on the web. And they're discussing it back and forth when Mark Andreessen, who's working on the Mosaic project, chimes in and he says, guys, 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 uh, I'm just about to ship it. It's called the image element, IMG. It takes an SRC attribute, you point to the image, and it's landing in Mosaic. And everyone else on the mailing list went, OK. Because what they had then was rough consensus and running code, and that was pretty much what trumped everything. But 
it's not like it's a great, well-designed element. I mean, you see, we don't get a closing tag, right? It's shipped without a closing tag. That means we can't put that fallback content in between the opening and closing tags. That's why we end up with this alt attribute, right, for alternative text. It's, it's a bit clunky. Um, but it worked uh, up to a point. Although I always felt like there was this clash in terms of how text is handled on the web, where it flows, right, no matter what the size of the container, compared to bitmap images, where you've got like a set width and a set height. Uh, and it really came to its head with responsive web design, right? where suddenly we're trying to be fluid, and yet we're bumping up against these fixed width things. And so that problem was solved with the introduction of the source set attribute. And the design here, again, is I really like this design pattern. It's not just that there's this new attribute introduced into HTML you know, instead of the source attribute. The way that source set works, and you give it a list of here's some other images that you know, are maybe larger, smaller, higher density, whatever, and you let the browser choose, what the source set attribute does is it actually updates the value of the source attribute. Now, what that means is you can't use source set without using source. In other words, you can't use this new feature for newer browsers without also providing something for older browsers. The backwards compatibility is built in. Because we know exactly how older browsers will treat source set. They'll treat it the same way they treat tags that they don't understand. They just ignore it. Right? They don't throw an error. They don't stop parsing the HTML. Uh, and so that responsive images solution, it's the same with the new elements we got, has this backwards compatibility built in where you must keep providing something for the older browsers. Very smart design decision, and only possible because of the way that HTML itself has been designed. It's basically, it's because of the HTML's fault tolerance that we can do this, that we can simultaneously introduce new features without leaving older browsers behind. And it's a similar story with CSS in terms of how it handles errors. And if you think about you know, all the CSS that's out there on the web, which is pretty much all of the web these days, right? How different these websites look. Um, you know, all the, the variety of things being conveyed by these websites. And yet all of it comes down to one simple pattern. And this is it. This is all the CSS ever written, ever will be written. You've got selectors, properties, and values. And that's it. A couple of special characters for the machines to parse, right? Curly braces, colons, semicolons. But uh, this is it. This is all of CSS. Of course, the tricky part is the vocabulary of the properties and the vocabulary of the selectors and all that. Um, but I kind of find this really beautiful that there's such a simple pattern capable of evolving into so much complexity. And again, if you think about what a browser does, if you give it some CSS it doesn't understand, if you give a browser a selector that doesn't exist, well, it simply doesn't match that selector, and so nothing inside the curly braces gets executed. But again, it doesn't throw an error, and it doesn't stop parsing the CSS and refuse to parse any further. Give it a property or a value it doesn't understand, it just skips that particular declaration and carries on to the next one. Doesn't throw an error, doesn't stop parsing. And if I think about how CSS has evolved over time, particularly in the last sort of five, six years, I think there's been two major developments. And one would be that we'd be using things like preprocessors or postprocessors, right? SAS and LESS, uh, stuff like that. Who here is using something like SAS or, or, or LESS or some kind of, okay, most people when they're writing their CSS. Um, and the other interesting development is that we we've kind of started to, to have these conventions around how we structure our CSS, things like object-oriented CSS, SMAX, BEM, you know, who's using some kind of system like that, BEM or some, yeah, right? Um, now, what I find interesting about both these developments, preprocessors, postprocessors, uh, uh, these, these methodologies, if you will, for structuring CSS, is that in neither instance did we, authors, developers, did we have to go to the standards bodies, or did we have to go to browser makers and say, oh, please implement this. Right? Because in the case of SAS or less, it's all done on your computer, and what gets spat out is still CSS, right? No need for the standards bodies to get involved. And in the case of these methodologies, we're really just talking about how we name things, and, and not even really looking at the properties or values, it's just about the selectors, right? Conventions around selectors. And what's interesting about that is, again, it didn't require anything new in CSS. In fact, because most of these are just dealing with class names, and class names have been in CSS right from the start, we could have had BEM 15 years ago, right? It's like the possibility for something like that was there the whole time. It's like it was staring us in the face and we didn't see it. I find that really interesting. That's something I want to come back to. So CSS and HTML, um, they're powerful 
in a way because because they're not so powerful, if you get what I mean. It's their error handling that makes them powerful, their, their simplicity, right? The fact that they're fault tolerant. And this, this idea of being tolerant of errors, uh, it reminds me of the robustness principle, you're probably familiar with, right? John Postel's law, to be conservative in what you send and be liberal in what you accept. Now, John Postel, he was talking about network architecture when he came up with this, because right? he was working on the ARPANET and the internet. Uh, and he was talking about this idea of how you would treat packages packets being, being rooted around the network. That if, if, you, if you receive a packet that's, you know, it's badly formed, but you still know what to do with it, well, just carry on rooting it around the network. Be liberal in what you accept. Don't throw an error, right? But when you're sending packets yourself, try to make them as well formed as possible. Be conservative in what you send. Now, this principle might sound like it's, uh, it's, it's only to do with engineering, right? That's quite a technical thing. But I see Postel's law at work all the time in the world of design, the world of user experience. Like, let's say you're putting a, a form online on a web page. Well, first rule is, you know, keep your form fields to a minimum. Don't ask the user to fill out lots of fields if you can keep the fields to a short number. In other words, uh, be conservative in what you send to the user. But then when the user is filling in that form, you know, don't make them format the telephone numbers with spaces or without spaces or the credit card numbers, right? Be liberal in what you accept. So Postel's laws is kind of all around us. And I think it's there in how browsers handle HTML and CSS. They kind of have to, right? If a browser was going to be stricter about the HTML and CSS it receives and refuse to parse HTML or CSS it doesn't understand, well, the user will just switch browsers, right? So browsers have to be liberal in what they accept. Now, when it comes to CSS and HTML, I think that one of the reasons why they can get away with this loose liberal error handling is because they're declarative languages, right? So with a language like HTML or CSS, you're not instructing the computer exactly what to do. You're simply telling it, here's what I want to happen. You go figure it out, right? I want this to be a paragraph. I want this to be read, whatever. But you know, the actual instructions to the computer, how you make something read or make something a paragraph, that's left to the, to the runtime environment. And for that reason, I think, we can afford to be, you know, tolerant in our error handling. Now, that's different with an imperative language like JavaScript, where you get a lot more control. I'm talking about JavaScript on the client side here, where you do get to say, this is exactly what I want to happen. You get a lot more power. But for that very reason, uh, and this might be a bit of a sweeping statement, I think that it has to be inherently a bit more fragile. So a bit of a sweeping statement to say this, but I think declarative languages tend to be more resilient, but less powerful, <coughs> whereas imperative languages are more powerful, but a bit more fragile. Right? Because you can't really have that same tolerant error handling in an imperative language. If you're trying to actually write a computer program, but you make a mistake, and the computer's just like, ah, don't worry about it, we'll all be fine. Right? That's not going to be helpful. Uh, so in the case of client-side JavaScript, if there is something that the browser doesn't understand, it will throw an error, and it will stop parsing the JavaScript file at that point and refuse to parse any further. Right? It's got to have a, a stricter error handling model. It kind of needs to do that because it's an imperative language. And that's okay, as long as we're aware of that, we can be more careful when we're writing our imperative uh, languages than we are when we're writing our declarative ones. Now, interestingly, w one point in the, w in the history of the web, we almost got the worst of both worlds in terms of the resilience and fragility. Uh, we almost got XHTML2. Um, you, prob you might remember XHTML1. That was fine. XHTML1 was simply the idea of taking the syntax of XML and applying it to HTML. Because the syntax of XML was that, well, all your elements have to be lowercase, all your tags, uh, you know, tag names, attribute names, lowercase, attributes need to be quoted, right? That's all fine. And in fact, it, it kind of enforced a bit of a, a standard around how we would write HTML. Because HTML doesn't care whether it's uppercase, lowercase, quoted, unquoted, it's fine. So XHTML1 was fine. It was just taking the syntax of XML and applying it to HTML, but it didn't really change anything about HTML. XHTML2 was going to be very different. It was going to fundamentally change the vocabulary, deprecate the image element, for example. Uh, but more importantly, it was going to take on the error handling model of XML. And the error handling model of XML is this. If there is a single error in the XML file, do not parse the XML file. Right? That, that's it's draconian error handling. Now, it never came to be. XHTML2 
never came to exist. Because we, as developers, as authors, and browser makers as well, rejected this. We said, no, that's absolutely crazy. Why would we put this in front of users? Something that's so fragile, that could break so easily, it just doesn't make sense. I'm going to stick with you know, resilient languages. So we rejected XHTML2 because of its strict draconian error handling. And yet here we are, about 10 years later. And somehow we've decided that it's perfectly acceptable to use something with strict draconian error handling to render some text on a screen. We're taking the most fragile layer of the stack and using it for the most important functionality. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a day when nobody in the world could download Google Chrome. Does anybody remember this? The web page for downloading Google Chrome was, was broken. You'd click on the link all you want to download Chrome, it wasn't going to work. And the reason was there was an error in a JavaScript file, which doesn't seem to make sense because why should the JavaScript have any effect whatsoever on clicking a link? But the reason was this. The link had been coded in such a way that it was using the JavaScript pseudo protocol, right? not really an href value. And so what you had was the, the most fragile layer of the stack being pulled down into the more resilient layer. You're getting you know, all the... Uh, all the, all the things that come with that fragility, but pulled down into a layer that's supposed to be more resilient and, and capable of responding to, to errors like this. Um, I mean, they fixed it. It all turned out fine in the end. And um, the error was probably completely unrelated. It was probably something completely different. But because of the error handling model of JavaScript, where one error is enough to stop the parsing of the file, there was a time when nobody in the world could download Google Chrome. And I think this points to another law that on the web is just as important as Postel's law, and that's Murphy's Law. Anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. He was a real person, by the way. He was an aerospace engineer. And because he had this attitude, nobody ever died on his watch. Now, we, we don't like to think this way. We like to pretend everything's going to be fine. And you know, in the case of HTML and CSS, we can kind of get away with thinking of that because the worst that's going to happen is that the browser's going to skip over something that you, know, you made a mistake in an element or you made a mistake in some CSS. No big deal. With JavaScript, it can be a big deal. Stuart Language put together a kind of list of all the things that can go wrong with client-side JavaScript. And some of these things are on the server, and some of them are on the network, and some of them are on the browser at the other end. But the point he's making here is that you can't predict. This isn't like, you know, oh, these particular browsers won't get your JavaScript. It's like, well, at different times, in different situations, different people won't necessarily get your JavaScript. Right? Using hotel Wi-Fi, I think we've all been uh, familiar with some of these issues. Um, and we need to accept this. And it's OK. Like, this isn't the end of the world. Other industries manage to accept this. You think about you know, the auto industry. And OK, probably the reason why they do this is because of regulation. But you know, they thoroughly test their cars. They, they strap in crash test dummies and smash them into walls. I mean, could you imagine if the auto industry one day said, you know, hang on, we've been thinking about this, and we're no longer going to strap crash test dummy, dummies into cars and run them into walls at high speed, because We've been thinking about it, and actually, we think that these cars will be driven by humans, not crash test dummies. Also, we anticipate that these humans will drive the cars on roads, as opposed to smashing them into walls at high speeds. And they'd be right, but yes, that's what we're all hoping, and you hope for the best, but you still prepare for the worst. And I don't think we're really preparing for the worst in our mindset. You can hope for the best and prepare for the worst at the same time. These two things are not opposed. And my friend Trent Walton, he's a designer in Austin, he, he wrote about this. He said, like cars designed to perform in extreme heat or in icy roads, websites should be built to face the reality of the web's inherent variability. The reality of the web's inherent variability. That's what we don't like to accept, that there is this inherent unknown nature to the web because of the browser. We talk about the browser. It's not the browser, it's the browsers, right? There are many of them on many kinds of devices. And you can't know for sure uh, what the situation is with the network, with the browser, uh, all the things that go wrong. And that's OK. We just need to acknowledge it. We're very good at, at creating consensual hallucinations, right? Like remembering when all websites were 800 pixels wide, or 640 pixels wide, or 1,024 pixels wide, when actually it could be anything, right? So we need to acknowledge the reality of the web's inherent variability. And I realize this sounds very doomy and gloomy up till now. It's all, you might be thinking, like, are you saying we shouldn't use JavaScript because of its error handling model? No, 
That's not what I'm saying at all. I did not come to give you problems, I came to give you solutions. Here's what I think we can do, and this is the approach I take when I'm building websites. It's going to sound deceptively simple, but here it goes. Three steps. One, you identify the core functionality of what you're building. Two, you make that functionality available using the simplest possible technology. And then you enhance. Okay, sounds pretty straightforward. Let's go through it step by step. First, identifying the core functionality. And you notice here, I did say the core functionality. The point here is not to identify what are all the possible things that users might want to do with this service. The point here is to narrow down, right? Converge, what's the one thing you want everybody to be able to do, regardless of what kind of device they have, regardless of what kind of browser they have. Narrow it down to the core functionality. Set your baseline. So for example, let's say you're a news provider. Uh, well, I would say your core functionality is providing the news. That's it, stop there, don't go any further. We're not even talking about technologies here. I'm not talking about how you're going to provide news, just identify what you're going to do. Let's say you're running some kind of social networking platform where people can uh, send messages and receive messages from one another all over the world. Well, that's it right there. That's the core functionality, the ability to send messages, the ability to receive messages. Stop. If you have a photo sharing service, the clue is in the name, the ability to share photos. Again, I want to be able to see photos, I want to be able to share photos core functionality identified. And let's say you've got some kind of collaborative tool for writing, uh, editing, and, and sharing with people. Those verbs right there. I want to be able to write, I want to be able to edit, I want to be able to share. Good. Okay, we've identified the core functionality, and we haven't even thought at this point about technology. And that's the correct way to do it. Don't start thinking about the technology first. Think about what the, what the, what the experience is first, what you want to provide to people. Now, Start thinking about technology, but this is the crucial bit. Make that functionality available using the simplest technology, not the best technology, the simplest technology. The reason you want to start by providing that core functionality you want everyone to be able to access with the simplest technology is that the simplest technology is most likely to be well supported by everyone by keeping it as simple as possible. So in the case of providing news online, I would say, well, the simplest technology I could use would be HTML to mark up the news. I mean, technically, the simplest technology would be a plain text file containing the news. But I'm going to allow myself to raise the bar slightly and say, well, we can use HTML. But that's it. OK, HTML is the simplest possible technology sent from a server to a browser. Done. In the case of a social networking site, I need to be able to see messages, probably in reverse chronological order. Well, we've got HTML for that. But I also need to be able to send messages. OK, this is where it's starting to get a little more complex. We're introducing form elements. Uh, send it to the server and now I'm able to send a message to other people. All right, that's the simplest possible way of doing this. In the case of a photo sharing service, it's very similar. It's still going to have a reverse chronological list, but this time it's not text messages. This time it's going to be photographs, so we need to use the image element. And again, a form is what we'll use to send the photographs, but slightly different this time. Instead of input type equals text, it's use input type equals file. As far as I can think, this is probably the simplest technology you can use to enable the core functionality of sharing photographs. Send this file to the server. The server then takes care of, of displaying it uh, to other people. And in the case of some kind of collaborative writing tool, I need to be able to write, I need to be able to edit, I need to be able to share. Text area. All right. That's the simplest technology I could think of. But if, if I were to stop at this point right, with those, those uh, services, I wouldn't be holding my breath waiting for the IPO. Um, it would suck. The experience would suck. We've got something that works for everyone, which is great, but it doesn't work particularly well. Well, that's absolutely fine because we've got step three, and this is actually where you want to be spending your time. The first two steps shouldn't take long at all. Right? We just thought, thought they're it, you know, very simple, low-level stuff. This is where you want to spend your time, is enhancing, improving the experience, making it really sing. This is where you differentiate yourself from the competition. right? Well, in the case of providing news, what we've got now is an HTML page sent from the server. Let's make it look good. Let's add layout using CSS. Now, it might seem weird to think about layout as an enhancement, right? But if you think about responsive design, particularly when you're designing mobile first and then adding in the styles and media queries for larger and larger screens, that's exactly what you're doing. You're treating layout as an enhancement. And note, every time I say enhancement, don't interpret what I'm saying as just an enhancement or merely an enhancement. Like I said, the enhancements are what matter. The enhancements where you really make the difference. 
I'm just acknowledging that they are enhancements on the core functionality. So we can make it look beautiful with layout. We can make it look beautiful with web fonts, right? Good typography on the web. Um, we have that now, which we didn't have before, which is amazing. Uh, and again, it's an enhancement. Not everyone will get that web typography, and that's okay, because everyone gets the core functionality, which is access to the news. Now, in the case of the social network we've built, yeah, technically it works. I can see messages, I can send messages, but God, it's you know, a terrible experience. Well, let's stop the whole full page refresh every time I send a message. Let's introduce some JavaScript, some Ajax, so that when I send a message, I don't have to refresh the whole page. And let's go further. When other people send messages, that I can see that without having the whole page refresh, right? Using some technology like WebSockets or uh, whatever we've got in the browsers that works, you know? And maybe not every browser supports these technologies. And again, that's okay because the core functionality is still available to everyone. We're layering this on top of that core functionality. In the case of the photo sharing app, let's do everything we've said already. Layout with CSS, fo web fonts, Ajax, web sockets, all that good stuff. Let's go further. What else can we do when you know, you're uploading the file? Well, before we even send it to the server, we can start using the file API, which you know, modern browsers have. What can we do with that file API? We can start playing with the image even before it goes to the server. Do things like add CSS filters. Put a sweet sepia tone on that image, right? And again, not every browser supports all these technologies yet, and that's okay. These are enhancements on top of the core functionality. You're providing to each browser according to its means. And in the case of uh, this collaborative tool, well, obviously we'll introduce Ajax and, and web sockets and, and layout and web fonts, all that good stuff. Uh, but let's go further. Let's not be reliant on an internet connection at all. Let's start using local storage of some kind and we have many kinds of local storage in browsers these days, uh, so that we can you know, start storing stuff locally as well as on the server. And let's go really far. Let's start, let's start making ourselves even independent of the network itself, start treating the network as an enhancement using something like service workers. This is probably the technology I am most excited about right now in front-end development. It feels like a proper game changer uh, in the same way that Ajax did. 10 years ago, that can fundamentally change how we build and design these things. And yet, it's been designed very true to those principles of the, the early web and the early HTML elements that you can only use service worker as an enhancement. You have to already have something working before you introduce the service worker to make it work better. Because the first time a user visits the, your, your site, there is no service worker installed. So it's kind of a genius bit of, of design because that means we can start adopting Service Worker right now. Even if it were only supported in one browser, we could start using Service Worker because it's entirely an enhancement, a very powerful enhancement. Um, yeah, Service Workers are, are kind of fantastic. All right, so that's a three-step process that you can, you can build something that works for everyone and yet rewards the newer, more modern browsers by using the latest and greatest APIs. Right? In a way, it's kind of giving, you, giving yourself the freedom to play with these new cool tools. By spending some time with steps one and two, you're, you're given freedom to go crazy at step three. And what, what I like about this pattern, this, it's really just a way of thinking, is that it's sort of scale-free. It works at different scales. I've only been talking at the scale of the entire service. Right? What's the core functionality of the entire thing you're building? But you could imagine applying these same three steps at the level of a URL. right? the level of a page. What's the core functionality of this page? How do I make that functionality available with the simplest technology, and then how can I enhance? Or you can take it further. We're all getting into our um, systems thinking and modular design and componentizing everything. You could apply this at the level of a component. What is the core functionality of this, of this module, this component? How do I make that functionality available with the simplest possible technology, and then how do I enhance? Right? Like you might say, okay, um, pr pr providing directions somewhere. Okay, that's the core functionality of this widget here. Well, the simplest technology to do that is some text with the address. Fine, that's done. We've done steps one and two. Now how do I enhance? Let's add a map. Let's enhance more. Let's make it a slippy map. Let's go further. Let's add a cool animations and you know, neat effects. You can just keep enhancing at level three because you've kind of given yourself the freedom to. Right? What I'm getting at here is that I want to get away from this, this idea that there's a dichotomy that you can either have uh, an accessible experience available to everyone, but it's boring, or you have this rich, immersive experience, but it only works in the latest and greatest browsers and devices. I'm saying you can have both. You can have both with the same code base, not at different URLs or different subdomains, 
but that the same site, the same service, can provide both at the same time. You know, we tend to talk a lot about technical debt, right, where some decision that was made in the past is now biting us on the ass, it's sort of come back to haunt us. Well, what, what this gives you, by spending time with steps one and two, what this gives you is technical credit. Right? You make sure you've got the core functionality av available to everyone, then you can go crazy at step three, and you've given yourself that kind of technical credit to, to use the latest and greatest APIs, regardless of what the browser support is like. Now, there's a bit of a myth, I think, when I talk about this, that people think, ah, if I'm considering how older browsers will behave with what I'm building, that means I'll be spending my time in older browsers. And actually, nothing could be further from the truth, in my experience, because I know exactly how older browsers will behave. They'll get, you know, the simple, uh, tech, you know, the simple functionality. It works for them. I don't need to spend my time with older browsers. I spend all my time in newer browsers, trying out this new cool stuff, trying out the latest APIs, safe in the knowledge that I know exactly how older browsers will behave. Now, I'm hoping we'll have some time for questions, but I want to preempt some of the, the questions you might possibly have, because I generally get two categories of pushback on this idea. And the first kind of pushback I get is people saying, this is too easy. Or rather, it's too simple, it's too naive, right? The idea that, um, yeah, this, this technique will work for a simple little website, but it couldn't possibly scale for the really complex thing that I'm building, right? Um, and what's interesting is that I've heard this pushback before. You know, when we were, I'm gonna show my age now, but when we were trying to move away from using tables for layout and font tags and instead use CSS, there were a lot of people said, well, that's fine for your simple little blog, but it's never gonna scale, scale for like real, you know, corporate websites. And then Doug Bowman launches Wired.com, and Mike Davidson does ESPN.com, and the floodgates opened, and now everybody uses CSS for layout, right? Or when Ethan came along with responsive design, there was a lot of pushback from people saying, well, that's fine, Ethan, for your little website, your simple little blog, but it could never work for this complex website app that I'm building. And then the Boston Globe launches, Microsoft designed their phone page, page to be responsive, and now the floodgates have opened there. And there's the same opportunity here. Floodgates could open to build rich, immersive applications that are simultaneously available to everyone, regardless what device or browser they're using. Something that works in Opera Mini on a slow connection and also works amazingly on the latest version of Chrome with all the latest APIs enabled, right? So that's the pushback I get, that this is too easy. But the other pushback I get is that this is too hard. That people look at the, the three-step process and they go, oh, I, are you saying, you know, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to spend my time making something that works and it's all these, you know, client server requests, and then when I start enhancing, I replace all that, I duplicate all that work, and now it has to all happen in the client? Well, not exactly, no. That's not what I'm saying. Because remember, I said you identify the core functionality. Not all the functionality, the core functionality. There's plenty of stuff you can add in step three that has no corresponding uh, functionality in steps one and two. As long as you make that core functionality work, it's fine. Uh, Matt Marquis, who worked on the Boston Globe design, he said, you know, there's lots of features on bostonglobe.com that don't work uh, with JavaScript unavailable, but reading the news is not one of those features, right? So again, it's about this difference between the core functionality. And hey, you know, these days with JavaScript on the server side as well as on the client side, you can shave off some of that time too. What are we calling it these days? Isomorphic, universal, whatever it is. There's now the possibility you could literally have the same code base on the client and the server. But even so, no, I'm not talking about reproducing everything uh, in the server and then on the client or vice versa. It's just having that, 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 that base that you can fall back to. And again, this pushback that this is too hard. And look, I'll tell you, the first time you do this, it will be hard. The first time you try and think this way and build a service, build a site, build an application in this way, it will take you more time, guaranteed. But I've experienced that before too. The first time I tried building with CSS instead of tables and font tags, it took me a lot more time. But the second time after that, it didn't take quite as long, and then the third time was quicker, and then it just became normal. Now I couldn't build using tables and font tags if I wanted to. And when responsive design came along, if you'd spent the last 10 years making fixed width web pages, and then you suddenly decide to try and make a responsive website, it was a world of pain, right? Right? And then the second time, well, still probably a world of pain, but not quite as bad. And then the third time it gets easier, and then it gets easier again, and now it's just normal. That's just how we do things. So it does take time. I'll give you that, but it's worth investing that time. Because fundamentally what it does, is it replaces the assumptions 
and these desires for control that we've had for years uh, with an acceptance of the, of the chaos, of the unknowability of the web. And it's the chaos of the web and the not knowing the browsers, not knowing the devices, it stops being something you fear and starts being something you embrace. And it's very, very liberating. But I do see pushback, like I said. And it, I, get, I get a bit sad sometimes when I see the nature of the pushback, particularly when people say this is too hard, it's too difficult. Because a lot of time what they're thinking about is developer convenience. And don't get me wrong, as a developer, I highly prize developer convenience. I want my life to be convenient. And I think developer convenience is important, but it is not as important as user needs. Whenever it comes to these two things, user needs has to win out over developer convenience. Most of the time they're not in opposition. Most of the time you get to have both. But in the situations where they are in opposition, I'm going to go for user needs every time. I've, I've often said that if I'm confronted with a problem on the web and I have the choice of making it my problem or making it the user's problem, well, I'll make it my problem every time. Because that's my job. I'm getting paid to do this, right? That's why it's called work. It seems like we've always been this way, right? The developers constantly complain, ah, that's too hard, that's too difficult. It's, it, we need to, need to make life easier. Like, web design will be so much easier when we have more than 216 colors to play with. It's true. One time we only had 216 colors, right? Our web design will be so much better when we can start using fonts other than these system fonts that come pre-installed on computers. Right? Oh, web, web development will be so much better once people upgrade from Netscape 4. Then everything is going to be great. If people would just upgrade from Internet Explorer 6, then life is going to be fantastic. It's those Windows XP users that need to upgrade so that everything will be fine. If those Android version 2 users would just get off and upgrade their system, right? There's always something. There's always something that we're, we're complaining about. Uh, my friend Frank Kamira wrote this story a few years ago called There is a Horse in the Apple Store. And in it, he describes the real experience of seeing a tiny horse in the Apple Store. And he describes seeing a tiny horse in the Apple Store, but he also describes the reaction, or complete lack thereof, by all the people in the Apple Store looking at the Apple devices. Like, there's this amazing thing right in front of your eyes. Does nobody see the tiny pony in the Apple Store? And he's taken to calling these things tiny ponies, things that are amazing, miracles, right in front of our eyes, but we don't see them. We've grown used to them. And I think that way about the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a tiny pony, right? This amazing thing right in front of us. That we're constantly complaining about what it can't do, whether it was CD-ROMs or Flash or native. We're always comparing the web to other media and seeing what the web can't do yet compared to those other mediums and completely missing what only the web can do. And that's this. This is the superpower of the web. This is the tiny pony. URL, so simple. How could this be a superpower? And yet, the ability to distribute software instantly, right, by a simple link, heck, by a post-it note, is amazing. The ability then to have it persist at this identifier, that you can not just build something for people to use right now, but you can build something over time that people can use now and in the future that you can extend the reach of our networks for future generations, extend the reach of the collective knowledge of our species. And that's a lot of responsibility, which means we need to be good ancestors and leave behind a web that lasts, a web that's resilient. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for two or three questions. Anybody with a question or comment? Uh, are there, no? Yeah. Are there uh, some examples in the web, uh, live examples of such a website which uh, you could discuss here? So, so the question is, are there examples on the web? Uh, yeah, there's plenty of them out there. Um, things you, you shouldn't notice is the thing. The, the, the thing about working in this way is that you know, no matter what kind of device you're using, you shouldn't notice that it's been built in that way. You really only notice under the extreme circumstances, right? We're on the, when you're on that crappy network and you're on that um, older device or whatever situation where, where things go wrong. Um, so there's a lot more examples out there of, oh, look at how this thing broke under unexpected circumstances. People tend, it's like air conditioning and nobody ever points out when the air conditioning is perfect. Right. Nobody ever stops the meeting and says, can I just say, whoever set the air conditioning, it's just right. right. You only notice it when it's too hot or too cold. So there's plenty of websites and services out there building this way, but it's not, it's not a feature, it's just how you build it. 
Um, you can see some examples uh, at progressiveenhancement.org, which is a website that collects tutorials, uh, articles, examples, stuff like that. Um, but in general, it's more a way of thinking, I think, than a particular thing. A lot of big players um, ended up sort of moving in this direction. There's, there's kind of pendulum swings that tend to happen. Like, I remember a few years ago, everyone was going down the client-rendered route for everything. Like JavaScript, all the things, right? Twitter did the whole hash bang URL structure, right? Where literally JavaScript was a requirement just to navigate from page to page. And they ended up going away from that and going to a more resilient architecture for that. Now, the reason for that wasn't this idea of, oh, make it available to the widest number of users and all that. No, it was simple performance. It turns out that front-loading everything into JavaScript means you have to wait for all that JavaScript to download, execute before the user gets anything. So the time to, to the user being able to interact with something is, is just not good enough if you're doing that. Um, so use, a lot of the big websites have, have you know, swung in that direction. But to answer your question, check out progressiveenhancement.org for some examples. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to spot these things because it's more a, it's such a low level way of working. Maybe one more? Don't be shy. All right, we got one here. Um, where do you stop? I mean, do you have to support Mosaic? And uh, also, in general, I think, um, in my view, there's a trade-off between back backwards compatibility and effort. Yeah. And it, to me, it sounds like you uh, think that you should always go with the backwards compatibility, which seems to be a bit naive, in my view. Naive. So that's exactly the pushback I was talking about. This is too simple. This is too naive. Too simple. Yeah. Um, so first of all, frame it in terms of the browsers you're supporting is exactly the wrong way to go around, because you're, think you're not thinking about which browsers will I support? You're thinking about what's the core functionality I want to make available. And then whatever browsers match that core functionality will get it. Will it support in Mosaic? Depends on how you set that core functionality. The example of news on the web, yeah, Mosaic will actually be able to receive that core functionality. The example of the photo sharing, it won't because there was no such thing as input type equals file in Mosaic. Now, I'm not going to add in a fallback for Mosaic because I don't design for browsers, I design for people. So instead of thinking about what are the browsers I'm supporting, and then building for that, you think about what's the core functionality I want to make available for browsers I don't even know exist. And yes, there is absolutely a trade-off, but if you make the trade-off early, the cost of change is extremely low. If you try and take an existing site or application and retrofit it to work you know, this way so that you're providing the core functionality, yeah, you're going to have a hard time. I would say the same is true of trying to retrofit for accessibility or trying to retrofit for responsiveness. You're taking something that already exists and trying to retrofit it, it's definitely tough. If, at the moment you begin building, you start thinking about this stuff, you make sure it's accessible, you make sure your the core functionality at least is available, then it's really not that much hard work. I won't lie, there's definitely an additional bit of work to make that core functionality available. But again, remember, I'm not talking about making everything available to everyone. I'm talking about making a distinction between here's the core functionality, and then from there, I'm going to have all sorts of features that you really need to have the latest and greatest browsers to receive. Now, in terms of where you draw that line, between what's core functionality and what's an enhancement, that's going to be completely different on different projects. But I would encourage you to draw that line based on the user needs rather than you know, your particular tech setup or whatever libraries you're comfortable with working with and all of that. So um, yeah, it's where you draw the line. And it's definitely easier to do this from the start than to try and retrofit something that's already out there. Good question. OK. Thank you very much, Jeremy.